السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نحمده ونسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم سل وسل بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وسهله دائما أبدا سلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم A few weeks ago, you know, as we were talking about the princess or the daughter of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, in talking about her, I mentioned uh, where during the time of Musa you know, after they had passed over the water and, you know, they asked Musa Islam to make an idol for them. You know, they pass by this city where they see these people worshiping idols and they say, oh, why don't you make something for us, uh, you know, similar to what they have. And of course, Musa al uh, you know, chastises them for, for even the request. But when he leaves, they go and they make one. One of them, named Samri, you know, he makes this idol out of gold. It's a calf. And in the Quran, Allah SWT mentions that he placed some dust in its mouth. And Allah SWT specifically mentioned that this dust came from underneath the, the, the feet of the messenger, meaning Jibreel here. Because Allah SWT has sent Jibreel to Musa And in reality, Jibreel was sitting on his horse. No one else could see this. But Samri, because of this no other knowledge that he had, he, no he saw this. And that's something we'll probably talk about later as well, inshallah. But he saw this and he took some dust from underneath the hoof of this horse and he kept it with him. And then now when, when he makes this idol, he placed some of that dust within the mouth of this, this golden calf and it starts making a noise. This lowing, lowly noise. And of course, people are worshipping it. But the reason I'm bringing this up, you know, because there are many lessons, of course, from everything in the Quran, but here this, you know, it's pointing or indicating one thing, which is what I want to talk about today. That anything connected to those that are close to Allah or loved by Allah, it has barakah in it, it has blessings in it. Everything connected to the ones that Allah SWT loves has blessings within it. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in you know in the in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, verse number two hundred and forty eight. And the verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Awdu billahi min shaitan wa qala in ayata mulkihi an ya'tiyakum at-tabutu fihi sakinatun min rabbikum wa baqiyatun min wa baqiyatun wa baqiyatun min taraktu alu taraktu alu Musa wa alu Fir'aun astaghfirullah wa baqiyatun min taraktu ala Musa wa ala Harun tahmiluhu al-malaika إن في ذلك لا آيات لا آية لكم إن كنتم تع إن كنتم مؤمنين. We'll go over the verse, but I want to go over the background to the verse. You know, but roughly a quick translation of the verse. And it was said to them by their prophet, 
that a sign of his kingdom or him being the king will be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send to him the tabut is a tabut or box with within which fihi sakinatum mir rabbim peace from your lord wa baqiyatum min taraktu and remnants from alu musa wa alu harun the family of musa and the family of harun and it will be brought to him by angels and then in the end he says and in this is a sign for those who are believers so the background to the verse is that Bani Israel, the children of Israel, they came to their prophet and it's disputed as to who exactly the prophet was, but it was a prophet. And they said that give us or appoint us a leader who will lead us into battle, you know, against all of these forces that are against us, that are opposing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give us a leader who will lead us into battle. And so the prophet appoints Talut alayhi salam. And when he appoints Talut al-Islam, now they object. You know, first they ask for a leader, and now when they're giving a lead, given a leader, they say, you know, why him? You know, he's from this, you know, he's from, you know, one of these lowly clans. He's not even a rich man amongst us. He doesn't even have any, any wealth. Why him? And so the Prophet says to them that a sign that he is the one that you are supposed to follow is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send tabut e sakina. Tabut e sakina, tabut box, sakina peace. This is, you know, according to many scholars, this is actually the box that, that Jibreel al-Islam brought for the mother of Musa al-Islam to place Musa al-Islam in when she placed him into the river. But Allah Subhanahu says about this box, He says, In it is peace from your Lord, and remnants from the family of Musa and the family of Harun. In English, they call this box the Ark of the Covenant. And we know that within it are the shoes of Harun and the belongings of Harun and the belongings of Musa. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even draw attention to their belongings. He says the, the, or the remnants of the uh, family of Musa and the family of Harun. Not Musa and Harun, which is significant and very important to understand. What had happened is that this was the box that whenever Bani Israel were in trouble, or if they went into battle, they would place this in front of them and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give them victory over their enemies. You know, annihilate the enemies. You know. Of course, Bani Israel is Bani Israel. And unfortunately, today, the Muslims of today are no less than the Bani Israel of that time. You know, if you look at our actions, you know, there's a direct correlation unfortunately. So they started doing things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them and he sends Jalut or in English Goliath. And Goliath, he's the king of this, of his realm and he brings an army and they take the box. Because they knew, oh, you know, this box is the reason that Bani Israel are given victory. So let's take the box and we can use the box. So he takes the box but they're disbelievers and they disrespect the box. And because they disrespect the box, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decimates six of his major cities, just wipes them out. The whole cities are, you know, just everybody dies in those cities. It's just in the, you know, and those who don't die have to leave. Just decimates them. And so this is when, when they see this, Jalut, he says he knows he can't destroy the box. Because he's seen what happened when they simply disrespected the box. So if he tries to destroy the box, what's going to happen? So he takes the box, he puts it on the ox cart, has two oxes tied to it. He hits the ox, go. You know, take it wherever, but take it away from us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has two angels come. They pick the box up, or they pick up the ox cart, and they place it in front of the house of Talut alayhi salam. You know, because this is a sign 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send this box back to him. So now he is your leader. So when we look at this, when we look at this, you know, again, the attention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing to the box, and when he's describing the box, he says, Sakinatum min Rabbi, wa baqiyatum min tarakta, min tarakta alu Musa wa alu Harun. So one translation is, that this is a box in which is peace from your Lord and the remnants from the family of Musa and the family of Harun. But wow or wa can also be tafsili in Arabic. Meaning that this is the box has peace or a peace from your Lord because it contains the belongings or the remnants of the family of Musa and the family of Harun. And then in the end he says, Inna dalika la ayat la ayatul lakum in kuntum mu'minin. And in this is a sign for you if you are believers. Okay. We'll come back to this end part because that's very significant. All of it is significant, but in this again, and all of it applies to us today. Because again, anything connected to Allah. And specifically those things connected to him through those whom he loves has significance. So just like this, the dust taken from the hoof or taken from beneath the hoof of the horse of Jibreel when placed in the mouth of this golden calf allows this calf, that inanimate thing, now to start making a sound. It's, it's funny because I was reading and funny and sad both at the same time because I was reading you know, this guy's description of this and he talks about the dust and he says, oh see, what Samri did was he took some sand and he hollowed out a part of the calf with the sand inside and so now, you know, because it was hollow, now when wind came through it, it made a noise. Yeah. Which of course, it, if that was the case, he could have taken any dust and done that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically says that he took the dust from underneath the, 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 the feet of the messenger. And here the messenger again being Jibreel al -Islam. So why does he specify that? Because it has significance. And this all gets back to love. And unfortunately, you know, we don't understand love. You know, for a lover, anything connected to his beloved is loved, is special. And, you know, there are a lot of people, they say, oh, you know, these relics and these things, they have no significance. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that, look, they have significance. You know, Bani Israel weren't given victory until they, they honored these things. And when they honored these things and understood the significance of these things, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory. Yeah. In the Battle of Badr, there was one of Quraysh, who was armored to the teeth, literally armored to the teeth. He was wearing armor and the only thing you could see was his eyes and his armor con concealed everything else. He had a sword in one hand, a spear in another hand. He had a dagger that he, that he lifted the, the thing up and he placed between his teeth. I mean, literally armed to the teeth. This is how they came to destroy the Muslims. And it was said that no one, can, no one will be able to even touch him. Zubair bin Awam, okay. who is also the cousin of Rasulullah so so he is the son-in-law of Abu Bakr, he is one of the ten Ashara Mubashara. Hmm? In the battle, he threw a spear. When he threw his spear, it hit this guy straight in, middle, in between his eyes. And he flies up and comes down and he hit him so hard with that spear that when they went to take it out, they had to stand on the guy's head to pull out the spear. And the spear was mangled, you know, with the force that it hit him with. And after the battle, Rasulullah says to Zubair, give me this. And he took it from him. And he kept it with himself until 
it came time for Abu Bakr. And then he took that spear. And then after him, Umar took the spear. And after him, Uthman took the spear. And after him, Ali took the spear. And then eventually it came back to Abdul, to the son of Zubair bin Abdullah ibn Zubair. But again, if it had no significance, then why is Rasulullah even asking for it? And then why is it being passed on through, through the leaders of the Muslims? Because these things have significance. Because again, they are connected with something. Even our ibadah is not ibadah unless it's connected. If you look at all of the ibadah in Islam, they are always connected with one of the lovers of Allah. And Hajj is, is a prime example. All of the arkan or all of the, of the uh, uh, rituals of Hajj are prime examples of all of this. The shirt of Rasulullah You know, Bibi Aisha Siddiqa, after Rasulullah she took that shirt and she kept it with her. One of his shirts she kept with, with her. And whenever anyone in Medina Munawwara was sick, they would come to her with some water and she would pour it on the shirt and then drench the water out of the shirt and they would drink it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give them cure. The blessed hairs of Rasulullah You know, the companions were such that when Rasulullah would make wudu, they would not even allow the water of the wudu to fall to the grounds before they caught it in their hands and rubbed their faces and their bodies with it. If he spat, his blessed saliva would not touch the ground. They would catch it. They did not let anything go. His nail clippings and his blessed hair. And in Hujjatul Wida, and the hadith are in Bukhari and Muslim. Hujjatul Wida, the final Hajj, when they shaved his head, Rasulullah calls Abu Talha al Ansari, he hands it to him, you know, all of the hair, and he says, Distribute this. And, the, and every companion, it was distributed among all of the companions. Khalid bin Walid One of the few generals in the world who is undefeated Period And some people say one of two And they include Jangliyaz Khan in that But if you look at the history of Jangliyaz Khan He lost to his brother when he was younger Khalid did not lose you know, Khalid is you know, if, if, if I take their definition of one of the two and, and they include Changuez, then, well, Changuez is out, or Genghis is out. So that leaves Khalid, period. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying one of the few because maybe there's somebody else who we don't know about. Undefeated. Mm -hmm. When all of this blessed hair is distributed, he is holding his, it in his hand and just looking at it in awe. And the Rasulullah is passing by and he asks him, he says, Oh Khalid, what will you do with this? And he says, I will use this to gain strength to fight the enemies of Allah and his messengers. And he had it placed in his cap. cap. And he would not go into the battle unless he had that cap. And in the Battle of Yarmouk, which was the deciding factor against the Byzantians, on the fourth day of the battle, which was the deciding day of the battle, his cap fell off. And he literally had his army stop fighting and look for the cap. And did not order them to start fighting again until he had it on his head. You know, because, you know, a lot of people, you know, we think, oh, if we had tabut and sakina, what could we do? Yeah. This goes through many people's minds, you know, if we had the box, what, what, what couldn't we do? Yeah. But again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he draws attention to the box, he says, you know, taraktu alu Musa wa alu Harun, the remnants of the family of Musa and the family of Harun. And just like the superior, superiority of Rasulullah over Musa and Harun al-Islam, 
so too is the superior, superiority of Alu, Alu Rasul وسلم, over the family of Musa and Harun. So we are given things greater than that. But the catch is, just like Jalut disrespected it, and all of these cities were destroyed, if we do not honor the gifts that Allah SWT gives us, and has given us, then why should we expect any other outcome than what we see happen to Bani Israel? Or what we see happen to Jalut and his people. You know, even like the blessing, you know, and, and there are many ways of disrespecting things. One is you say, oh, it's not significant. You know, deny its significance. This is also disrespect. You know, another way, you know, there's a guy now in a in, in, uh, certain place. Uh, he has large following. You know, and you know they teach stuff, and you know, and and they have quizzes, and in the quiz, if you win the quiz, you know, they you're given mubarak. Mubarak is a Persian term. Mu means hair, and mubarak, of course, blessed. And so, generally, people from Persia or the subcontinent, when they refer to the blessed hair of Rasulullah, so they they say mu mubarak. 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 And so this guy, you know, the, you know, his students and their scholars and they're having these quizzes and somebody wins the quiz and he says, oh, you know, this is a gift for you, Mu'a mu, mu Mubarak. And yet the, it's the hair of their sheikh. Yeah. This is another way of disrespecting the honor and the status of Rasulullah yeah, so that brings us to you know there are many things and I probably will talk about some things next week as well inshallah and I'm going to say something now that I probably will repeat after Salat and maybe you repeat it again next week as well the you know we went through all of this corona stuff and we're still going through the corona stuff you know and, and we went through the lockdown and, and we'll probably go through the lockdown again we'll see what happens and of course even this place was closed you know and then Allah subhanahu wa gives us the gift of opening it back up and we still don't really honor that gift you, know, you still see you know handful of people that come initially and then you know uh, last in first out uh, in England even today in England you know they have the COVID marshals so in Juma you have to have a ticket to get in and you have to apply online and you get the ticket before you get there you have to have a ticket you have to wear a mask you have to wear gloves uh, and suit up you have to bring your own janamas and you have to be six feet apart. Otherwise, the COVID marshal can shut things down. Which is interesting because when they open the pubs up, you know, no one's six feet apart. Uh, they were too drunk to be six feet apart. And probably the COVID marshal was too drunk as well to notice that they weren't six feet apart. No. But no problems there. But for the massage, you know, it's a strict rule. And you know, and the other, you know, I saw a video, somebody sent me a clip of uh, some Middle East, one of the uh, Gulf states where they saw it called, uh, you know, they opened up finally the masajid and, you know, and somebody hears the aqama and he's running to the masjid with his phone and he's, oh, you know, I heard the aqama and he's talking on the phone and they are, you know, videoing himself as he's running to the masjid and how, how delighted he is, you know, to see that the masjids are open now and he runs in there and makes his salat and he talks about how excited he was. And of course, you know it's all fake because if he was truly excited, he wouldn't have remembered to pick his phone up. Uh, and, uh, uh, and if he did remember to pick his phone up, he wouldn't have remembered to, to video himself and then post it. You know, so it's all this, this fake stuff. And the same way with us here. You know, we say, oh, you know, it, it's, it's closed, oh, I wish it was open, I wish it was open, but then when it's opened, well, where are you? 
you know. And then when it does, or or if people do come, you know, you know they're too busy talking, too busy doing anything else to listen to what's actually being said. So just there's no self-discipline, no control. And again, these are gifts that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us. And if we do not honor His gifts, and of course the greatest gift that He sent is His own Habib, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, that's something no one does. People give various things as gifts. No one gives their beloved. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has sent His beloved, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to us. And we still don't know how to honor him. And then again, we want some other outcome other than what we've seen before with everybody else who dishonored the gifts of Allah. You know, that's, that's true insanity. You know, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. You know, if I hit my hand with a hammer, it's going to hurt. And it doesn't matter whether I hit it one time or two times or a hundred times. So if I'm hitting it on the hundredth time and expecting, oh, it's not going to hurt anymore, I'm insane. And that's the condition of the Muslims today. Instead of going back to Allah and His Messenger. <laughs> Understanding how to honor and respect the Messenger. <laughs> and we say, no, we need this. We need to do this. The foundation is on shaky ground. It's, I mean, the foundation is on ground that doesn't even stand still. And then we want to build a, a, a nice building on top of that. Yeah. I'm going to say a few other things next week, inshallah. But again, you know, those things that are connected. Again, like the shirt of Rasulullah and the blessed hair of Rasulullah you know. And again, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in in this verse, He doesn't even draw the attention to the to the belongings of Musa or, or Harun al -Islam. So even those who are connected by blood to Rasulullah through the progeny of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, that status is above the progeny of Musa or Harun. So, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and uh, fill our hearts with His true love, allow us to understand, uh, and uh, you know, fill our hearts with the love of the, the ones that He loves, you know, the family of Rasulullah and the companions of Rasulullah and all of those who love Rasulullah Because that's the criteria for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to love us. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ you know, when, they, when the companions ask Rasulullah says, how can we love Allah? And how can we have our sins forgiven? Allah SWT says what? Tell them. Oh my beloved, you tell them. That if you want to love Allah, then you ittaba. Follow with love. Follow me with love. And then it's not that you will love Allah, but Allah will love you. And He will forgive your sins. You know, in the field of love, you know, being a lover is a lower grade than being the beloved. Because if I love somebody, he may not reciprocate that love. But if somebody loves me, then that's a much higher status. And so in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us through his Habib وسلم, that if we love Rasulullah وسلم, and follow, and, and that love inculcates or, or drives us to follow Rasulullah وسلم, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love us and forgive our sins. But the last part of that verse that we mentioned before, verse 248, uh, inshallah I'm going to go over that next week. Because in that he says that in this is a sign for those who truly believe. So if we truly believe then, then you know, there is a sign there and I'm going to point that out inshallah next week. So again, may Allah guide us and, and save us. And those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah inshallah.